And that's why I like this podcast here, right? So it, in my personal reading, there's certainly going to be times where I miss stuff like this. Like even even today, like I just assumed they was a crowd. Right. I didn't even consider that it might be the disciples. But when you read it, it the text doesn't make it clear right. who they who they are, who they yeah, are. Who they are, yeah. When you think about the profound influence of the Bible on the world, the way that it has shaped our culture, whether you're a follower of Christ or not, it's probably a good idea that you know at least what it says. It's going to be about us taking and reading the Bible. All right, welcome back to the Take and Read podcast. I am so glad to have LJ back. It has been a while. It's good to be back. Uh, we've got some under, summer under our belts. Yeah, baby. Uh, but uh, yeah, for you, summer has got to be an interesting season. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who, are, who have just joined us and maybe don't recall, LJ uh, serves our church family here at FBG in the area of kids ministry. So as our kids pastor... He's got to, there's a little bit of some rhythm that goes along with the school schedule. That's right. But then there's some stuff that doesn't, doesn't adhere to that. Then there's summer schedule. Summer schedule. So it's, it's lighter, but it's heavier. Talk about that. That's right. So I love the summer. Um, Once we jump into kids activities, camps, those weeks themselves are a lot of fun and really busy. And I wear myself out during those weeks, but it, it's worth it. Um, but it's a change of pace when it comes to weekly programming. Mm-hmm. And so I get at least like nine hours a week back um, that I okay. use for planning for the following school year. And right. then maybe even beyond that if I have time. So I love the summer with that in mind. A lot of interaction with kids that's different because of camp. And then tons of planning. So it's been good so far. Do you see... In the summer, a higher percentage of kids that maybe don't aren't around church or don't have families in church just because of the nature of camps. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. So it's not uh, it's not uncommon. Like you know, we just wrapped up what we call wind shape, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know, we're looking at uh, we probably had five hundred, right? And so out of that crew, man, I would say there's a good at least twenty five percent that have not ever really been to a church. Mm -hmm. There's probably another 25 to 35 that go every now and then. And then the rest are kind of hit or miss church kids. Some really committed church kids. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Cool. How's, how are things going with you? You get some rest during the season. That's right. So uh, I take two weeks off in the summer during different months. So just wrapped up one of those. Um, So after that wind shape, uh, we went on to Dallas and hung out with a family that's kind of unofficially adopted me oh, cool. uh, since I was in college. So we do that every year with them. Uh, it's a family staycation is what we call it. And so we all stayed at their house, uh, Nana and Poopa. Nice. And uh, we do just random stuff in Dallas. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, um, I mean, that brings up something that you and I can relate on coming from a family situation where dad wasn't present. Uh uh, And it's interesting how the Lord provides in the life of a believer that I didn't have lack of men investing in me. Yeah. And so uh, where sometimes I think people look at me and go, well, what your dad wasn't around to, you know, are you okay with that? Did you grow up? Or you got some wounds? And surely there's some frustration there oh, no that doubt. resides. And I see that in my own parenting and how, man, I would have loved to have had this exemplified for me or Absolutely. someone to speak in it, or I'd love to be. But the Lord's faithfulness to provide men yeah. that have invested in, and you can speak to the same oh, thing. no doubt. All the way through. Um, you know, my dad went to prison when I was three, and I, I can look back and see – how God placed different men in my life to help mentor me, push me along, teach me random things. Um, And so in some sense, like it's a blessing to have that variety of experience. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. And yeah, I didn't grow up with dad around. And when I met him, he was in prison. And so I wanted to know who this guy was. I want, I was a teenager. 
I wanted to meet this guy. And it's this weird kind of, I want to see if he kind of signs off, if he checks off on me or not, but then also just kind of want to know, like, is there something of myself in there? Is there something I need to be warned by? Yeah. But yeah, um, it's amazing how that has informed my ability to, to love other people Yeah. and to identify um, ways to serve. So anyway, yeah, uh-huh. we've never talked about that connection before. No. <laughs> okay. So this is random. Um, I remember what it was like when my oldest was born and holding him for the first time mm-hmm. and then had all these thoughts about like, I wonder what this experience was like for, for my actual dad, for him, yeah. the same experience. And then, then you like the, the weight of that responsibility starts falling on your shoulders. You're holding this like not even one hour old baby. Yeah. And it's like, man, this is, this is a lot. And then start thinking like, can I carry this out all the way through? Like, yeah. God, I need you, man. I need <laughs> yeah. you. That's exactly what it is. There's a mixture of holding that newborn and asking, how could anyone ever walk out on this? Yeah. And then you start to almost kind of zoom out and look at, okay, we're talking 18, 20, 30 okay, this changes everything. Everything. No day in the future will it be the same as it is or was two days ago. That's right. And that's heavy. Yeah. And I I remember one night we had finally gotten to take him home from the hospital and I'm sitting there going, I don't have a plan for his college. Yeah. That's that's something I hear people talk about. I should probably get a plan. And then I started stressing (laughs) out. Anyway. Nah, it'll be fun. It'll be good. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, since you've last been here, I think you were several episodes ago, and we've made our way all the way to Mark chapter 8. So we're still, this is episode 36, so we're, we're taking our sweet time. That's so crazy. Sweet time. And it's been, man, I, I sometimes I, I kind of feel bad for the guest because unless you're like regularly tuning in, you won't necessarily have the advantage of what was discussed last time. Whereas I do. And then anyone else who's a regular listener, they're like, Oh man, last time you mentioned. And so I do my best to try to catch us up. Um, one thing that's, that's transpired is, you know, right, right before the section we're going to be in, we'll be in Mark chapter eight and it's just a short little passage. It's 22 through 26. This short little episode and I think that at first people kind of go, what? Like he's already healed people. Okay. Why this particular incident okay. of healing? And when you start to kind of reflect on what has just happened, uh, Jesus has been warning uh, his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees of Herod and the way that that analogy of leaven in bread and, and the, the way that that spreads, it doesn't. There's no part of the bread that's not affected by it, even though it may be a small amount. Okay. And he's talking to them about bread and he, he kind of, you can see the frustration in him when he says in verse 18, do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? How do you not remember when I broke the five loaves of the 5,000 and had 12 baskets left over? And, and he kind of goes through this process with them, like, you still don't get this. Yeah. Like you still can't see. You don't have eyes to see. You don't have ears to hear. What in the world? Uh, and so it's it's interesting where this takes place in all of it. Okay. Um, because there's this little episode of healing. And then after this, in the next episode, we'll jump into a, an extremely pivotal moment in the Gospel of Mark. Okay. So what in the world is this? And I think it has equal value and what, what Mark is trying to communicate and also what Jesus is. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 8, 22 through 26. Let's jump in. Let's take and read. They came to Bethsaida. This is Jesus and his disciples. They brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and brought him out of the village, spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him. He asked him, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking. And again, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes, 
The man looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him home, saying, Don't even go into the village. And that's all we get. That's it. So apparently, all we get is all we need uh, to understand. And again, it's hard to just kind of take a snippet. And so there's, yeah, let's jump in first and, and wrestle with what it says. Uh, we understand that the scene, the scenario, Bethsaida, I mean, that's where they were headed even when they, they left the the side of the Sea of Galilee where yeah. the feeding of the 5,000 happened. Jesus sends his disciples out into the boat and he tells them, go to Bethsaida. Yep. And so they struggle on the boat and that's when he walks on water and you know he's revealing himself Fun and they scene. get to the, the next um, the Gennesaret uh, Sea side. So we know that this is where he's been headed. Uh, I think you have... Uh, Peter, Andrew, and one of the others, maybe one of the James okay. or Matthew, this is their hometown. Okay. So it's the very north end of the Sea of Galilee. And so this is hometown for some of the guys that are his disciples and apostles that have been called by him. Uh, and so he they, they get there, and as soon as they get there, a man's brought out to him that's blind. And they beg him, please heal. So, you read it right. It says, Jesus he spit, in his, spit eyes. in his eyeballs. Like, the guy is blind. Mm. So, he doesn't see it coming. Can't see it coming. No, can't see it coming. <laughs> so, probably good, because he probably would have flinched. I'm just saying, man. <laughs> Jesus spits on his eyes, and then says, places his hands on him. We don't know if he grabs him by the shoulders, yep. the face, the eye. We don't know. He just puts his hands on him, touches him. But there's this emphasis on the fact that he spits, which there's a whole other thing. Like when we get into what this means, like the cleanliness thing, yeah. like that would probably be unclean, I would imagine. Gotta be unclean. So that happens. But then there's another component of he can kind of see, almost like it didn't fully work. Yeah. And so then Jesus touches him again, and now he can see clearly. First time he's like, yeah, it must have been blurry. He says they look like trees walking around. We don't know. Maybe he just doesn't understand what humans look like. Yeah. But how does he know what trees look like? Okay. And so it's this gradual sight that is restored in this healing incident. Yeah. So yeah, what what are what else do we need to know about this scenario? I, do you think? I, I think. It's interesting that when Jesus gets there, um, they've already brought him someone. Okay. It's like so, so that word has gotten to them, and then I'm thinking like somebody goes, "He's here, he's here," you know, and so someone made it a point to get that blind man to Jesus right off the bat. Yeah. Ready for him to help in whatever way. Now I know there's other times in the New Testament where Jesus heals even blind people without spitting in their eyes so I've, there's times where he has healed people from great distances yeah because somebody's faith just like that. uh earlier in in mark chapter seven there's a guy who's um deaf and mute yeah and he he puts his fingers in his ears and then he spits and touches the guy's tongue and the guy can now hear and talk and so now here's this spit on the eyeballs I think wrestling with it's is it it's not the spit that's right it's powerful we got to probably make that point that there's nothing in his saliva he doesn't have magical saliva yeah. right but there's something then symbolic about everything yeah everything he does means something it's got to mean something and so why did the healing take a while or have slow to develop when he could have thought it he could have said it yeah could have spit in the mud and then put it on there, which he does other places. Yeah. This time he, he literally spits in the guy's eyes. That's interesting. Anything else here? Like, yeah, we see that news of him has traveled. We've got people gathering. I, I think, you know, Jesus asks him the question if he can see. I think Jesus would know if he could see. Right. Um, so I, I wonder why it's... It's like a two-step healing. I can't get my head around that yet. Um, and then 
at the end of it, he tells him to not even go into the village. Like, don't go talk about this. How could I not talk about it? Right. You know, like I'm thinking about when, when I received glasses for the first time, I'll never forget that moment. Hmm. And when I got home, I didn't wear them home because they, they told me it would make me sick if I did. They need to get used to it. And so, you know, start wearing them slowly. But I was sitting in our living room and I put them on and I looked at the carpet and I was like, I can see like individual fibers of our carpet. And then right outside of our, our living room was a, a glass door and I could see a pecan tree in the front yard. No kidding. And I was like, man, I can see individual leaves. I go outside and I look at the grass. I'm like, I can see the blades of grass. Like <laughs> I have been missing out, man. And so maybe that first healing was like w- what my eyesight is without my glasses on. Um, but I'll, I'll never forget like just the feeling of, I can see so much now I have missed so much and didn't even realize it. Mm-hmm. So, so much. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's for the people gathered there because we wrestle with what would this have meant or what would the experience have been if you're, if you're rolling with him, right? You've got, you've got the people that are with him. So his disciples, some of those are coming home, like their hometown boys have been journeying. Yeah. And the first thing that happens, they don't get to go see their loved ones. Maybe their loved ones are the part of that crowd. We don't know. You've got the crowd. You've got the individual who's just been healed. Yeah. And then on top of that layer, you've got the audience that Mark is communicating to. Yeah. And, G- and this being the collected p- uh, preaching of, of Peter, it's who, you know, why would Peter include something like this? in this clearly developed and intentional account of Jesus's life and ministry. So let's just start with the first group, the disciples. They they keep rolling and they're wrestling with all kinds of stuff. Yeah. They just get done getting this lesson told to them about the leaven. Yeah. And they're like Okay, um and and it was part of that lesson was this requesting of a sign demand this generation demanding a sign that he is who he says he is and it's like are you kidding me yeah like okay um no sign will be given to this generation uh and the disciples had forgotten to take bread and had only one loaf with them in the boat so now they're 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 totally worried about are they gonna have enough to eat yeah and then he's like are you do you have eyes to see do you have ears to hear yeah let's think back it, don't you remember what happened? Do you think one loaf of bread is an issue for us? Remember the the five loaves? How much were left over? They're like oh, twelve baskets. How about that? Just recently, I just four thousand people gathered. How many? Seven baskets. Yeah. Guys, how can we're you be, be fine. How can you be worried about a bread? You still don't get it. Yeah. And so. I don't know if they would have made the connection. To me, I see a connection between that incident and this one. Oh, for sure. He says, do you have eyes to see and ears to hear? Do you not know who I am? Yeah. Like you're worried about bread still? I just, I've fed thousands and thousands of people on a couple of loaves. Are you kidding me? I can, I can hook you guys up. Yeah. But they don't, they don't see it. Yeah. And so then he performs this miracle that has to do with sight. Hey, now we're talking. Now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> they don't have eyes to see or ears to hear. He's previous to this has healed somebody who's deaf and mute. Yeah. That now can hear and speak. And he's doing this all in front of the disciples. And they're still worried about a loaf of bread. And man, we can only get like four sandwiches out of that. What are we doing? Yeah. And then he's like, okay, okay you don't have eyes to see. And then it's almost as this, if he does this miracle, actually, that's also a parable. Yeah. Like, he doesn't speak the parable, he does the parable. He's like, your faith or your ability to see is like a blind man that would. Now, and I'm not saying that's what the text says, but it's like. The the question applies to them. I mean, it parallels, right? Do you not have eyes to see or ears to hear? The question of, do you see anything? Yeah. Like, obviously, they don't see what they're supposed to see. The disciples don't. 
and I, there's a there's something to the progressive nature of this healing yeah that i think we're supposed to see that again we talked about man he could have healed him any way he wanted yeah. and it could have been instant in fact he has done that multiple times instant healing this is one of the rare times where it's progressive healing yeah and i think i think it's a, a symbolic healing i think it actually happened but i also think it points to the progressive nature of their ability to see the kingdom of God. Yeah. Like, although they're so close to it and they're around him all the time, they see it once and they're like, they have partial vi- like, uh, oh, I can kind of make it out. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't fully understand what they're seeing and it's progressive. And I think it alludes to what happens in the end Man, of that's chapter a fun eight. Thought. That's such a fun thought. I didn't think through stuff that's happened earlier in Mark, even from when I've been on before, you know, like Jesus does something incredible and it's like they store these things in their brain. Like, oh yeah, he can do that too. Like he can, he can heal a guy that's possessed with demons among demons. Yeah. Or he's on the boat. He's on the boat. Who's this guy that even the winds and the waves obey him? What in the world? Yeah. And then the multiple healings, the feeding of the 5,000. And he, at, at right after that, he's like, don't you guys understand the feeding of the 5,000 and they don't get cause they're afraid of him as he's walking on water. Yeah. And they're like, who is that? And he's like, it is I don't be afraid. Have courage. It is I, he's basically saying Yahweh, right? Yeah, he's, it's it's the, the Greek um, transliteration. It's me. And they're like, ah. and he goes, and they were frustrated because their hearts were hardened and they didn't understand the feeding of the 5,000. Yeah. So there's this, kind of progressive understanding and seeing of who he is as much as they're, he's trying to reveal them to them who he is. And I don't know why, why it has to be progressive for them. Cause there's others who clearly in the scripture immediately know like yeah. there's the uh, episode uh, a few episodes ago earlier um, in chapter seven, okay. where there's like a, a guy who's crying out, a blind man who's crying out, son of David, son of David, heal me, or something like that. And it's a it's a blind guy, and so yeah. he can't see him, but he, he knows exactly who he is. He, he's like, it's the Messiah, son of David, come and heal me, and so he does. And it's like, well, and the guy knew. The guy yeah. saw him, even though he was blind. Yeah. And so there was even this symbolic nature in that episode, now that I'm thinking about it, where Here's a guy who can't physically see, but sees Jesus clearly, calls him the son of David, and has no doubt, if you would, could you heal me? Could you make me see? He's like, I will. Go ahead and see. He instantly sees. Right there. And there's a symbolic nature to, well, he could see and he was blind, but the disciples are not blind and they can't see. They can't see, yeah. The the step, this first step of, Okay, I, I wasn't able to see, but now I can see, but things are still blurry. Like these people look like trees. Um, I, I could see how that parallels with the disciples' perception of Jesus right mm-hmm. here. Like, yeah, they, they have an idea that he's the Messiah. They should. Right. They have an idea that he's incredibly powerful, that he's able to do things that, that no one's been able to do, um, that he can help them. But yet they don't see it clearly because they often forget or fail to like even call out to him for help. Right. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know, man. I don't know. So, well, well it's as we, as this kind of stirs a little bit, we've got other people that are present for this. So you not only have those, the disciples who have this history with him, then there's this gathered crowd. Yeah that clearly understand his reputation. Otherwise there wouldn't, they wouldn't have gathered there and they brought a guy who was blind to be healed. So we can already understand what they believe about him. He's got a reputation and that reputation is that he's got some sort of power or ability to heal. Well, maybe they don't know why they, they don't know who he is, but yeah. they know what he can do. And so, how are they experiencing this healing situation? I don't know. Thoughts? You know, I start thinking through, you know, like modern day celebrities, like um, 
if, if you hear that a celebrity's coming, you know, people are going to go out of their way to at least witness that celebrity, maybe even try to interact with or experience that celebrity. So, so I think there's some of that happening. Like I, I heard from my cousin Joe that, mm-hmm. that this guy named Jesus has done this. And then I also heard from my aunt Sue that Jesus did these things and they're saying that like he's here like yeah i'm gonna go see what's going on right um and see if i can see something incredible myself um i don't i don't know that they're to that next level of wanting to follow him for him being their lord maybe be with him to be a witness to the the great things incredible things that he can do um and there's a history too for jesus in this place i mean if this is where some of the disciples are from, he's been there before. Yeah. He's called these men, and I'm sure it's gotten around the community that, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? They just yeah. up and left their nets. Yeah. They left their boats. They just peaced out. How how are they going to earn? How are their family going to be provided for? They've got taxes due. They've got yeah. what? In the, so there's some sort of knowledge of him, but to what extent they believe in him as the Messiah, we don't know. Yeah. But we do know that they came expectant and he fulfilled their expectations. Yeah. Probably surpassed them. No doubt. And and just before this, religious leaders are asking for a sign. Yeah. And he's like, this generation won't get a sign. However, these people at Bethsaida, oh, they got something. Oh, they got a whole <laughs> lot, man. I'm just thinking if, if somebody in that crowd retells that story, it's like, yeah, this guy named Jesus came and y- y- y'all have heard about Jesus, right? And like, he spit in this guy's eyes. Like, yeah, you heard me. Like, he spit in his <laughs> eyes. And now he can see. Like, what? Like, I'm going to, if Jesus is in my area, I'm going to go see if I can find him. Yeah, buddy. If any of my, if my family's hurting, oh, I'm taking him. I'm going to oh, figure no out, do I know anybody that I even remotely care for that needs some sort that of needs healing? something. I'm going to get him to him. Oh, absolutely. How many, uh, like I could, <laughs> if my sons saw somebody do something like that and it actually made them healed, my sons would be taking turns spitting on each other's faces. <laughs> That's how they roll. No doubt. My oldest would be no like, doubt. hey, Titus, hold still. Yeah. And he would hawk a loogie. Anyway, Ugh. that's that's brothers for you. Yeah, man. Um, okay. And so then you've got, uh, and I think that we're kind of in a similar boat, but you've got this audience or this group of people that would have received Peter's teaching about this yeah, along with all the other stuff. So that's you've right. got this episode is confined to the crowd that's gathered, the guy that's there. I mean, that's another person we haven't talked about how, what does this mean for him? Here's a guy who's all of his friends have pulled him and dragged him there. And he's probably like, look, I don't want to bother the guy or look, I've tried everything. I don't, and maybe he doesn't have the faith, but these people do, we don't know. But this guy can now see. And what he's been told is, now that you can see, don't go back to the village. Oh, where where am I? Live on the shore here? Yeah. What, what do I? Just don't go. And the implication is don't go and demonstrate that you can see because people will know the difference. Yeah. And so for some reason, it's not to be talked about, not to be known. Part of that messianic secret. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, okay, there's, a, there's an element, a timing, a, something that this has got to track with the timeline and it's not time or something. I don't know. But you know, it'd be no question if he went back to people that knew who he was, like they would immediately know what happened. Somebody spit in my eyes. Who did Jesus? Oh man. Who is this Jesus? Right. Then think back to even the, the guy who was possessed and what happened to him after he was possessed. What did Jesus tell him? Yeah. Was he supposed to go tell people or was he supposed to keep quiet? Yeah. And, and so, and it's interesting because a crowd says they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. They came to Bethsaida. I guess what I don't understand is, is it a crowd? Or is it I, the disciples? Yeah, I just assumed it was a crowd, but maybe it is the disciples knew of a guy and they just went and got him once they got there and said, here's a guy. So we don't know. I guess yeah, we got to be a little bit careful. That is a good careful. thought, right? So if it is the disciples, though, how did they find out about the guy? Right. 
or maybe somebody knew about them because some of them they, were already from yeah, there. Yeah, they grew up there and they're like, hey, like, there's I have this guy. this friend that I grew up with right. that can't see now that we're here. Can we make this happen? That's an interesting thought, especially after the conversation of them not being able to see or right. hear. And I don't know if this episode takes place in other Gospels. I didn't, um, I guess that'd be something to explore too if there's more details elsewhere. But we don't know if it's a crowd or it's the disciples. It doesn't say a crowd. Yeah. Um, where elsewhere it will say then a crowd gathered or. That's, yeah, that's a good point, man. So it could be just the disciples and this guy. And he tells the guy, don't go into the village. Yeah. Because that would make more sense. Like, what's the sense if a huge group of people saw this happen and he only tells the guy, don't yeah, go? I'm trying. The group is like, I didn't say, well, you can't stop a group from talking oh, about it. No way. So that's interesting. Yeah, I, I think I'd want to explore that a little bit more. And that's why I like this podcast here, right? So it, in my personal reading, there's certainly going to be times where I miss stuff like this. Like, even, even today, like, I just assumed... They was a crowd. Right. I didn't even consider that it might be the disciples. But when you read it, the text doesn't make it clear right. who they who they are, who they yeah, are. Who they are, yeah. And so other than the they that's right before that and the beginning of the sentence is a clear reference to the disciples and yeah. the party of Jesus. Yeah. Wow. That that changes things because there's now a a section of population that did not experience this, that yeah. maybe we were like, Hey, I wonder what they thought. Yeah. So yeah, I think we have to limit our scope on that. Okay. Um, but then the question does is with the audience for Mark. So as Mark is writing and recording these events, there are things that he puts in order on purpose. Yeah. He organizes this a very particular way and he, his message is to show to anyone who picks this up, that Jesus is the Christ. He says in chapter 1, verse 1, this is the gospel of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Yeah. And and from here on out, he's going to demonstrate that he is the Messiah, the chosen one, the one that was spoken of and prophesied. And so there's something about this, and there's something about, um, th- yeah, the order of events. So... I think his original audience is as they hear this, right? It's not these, it's not parsed out. Like we take it here. Yeah. They're most likely going to get this gospel in one scroll. It's going to be read in one sitting. Yeah. So if you've ever sat down and and listened to, I've, I've done it a few times when I'm getting ready to preach through a book or something, I'll listen to the audio of a letter or a book from beginning to end yeah, it takes you know, 20, 25, 30 minutes. And to all of a sudden you start to see themes where it's not separated by weeks or months and you go, yeah. Whoa, he's saying the same thing. Like that's something you'd pick up in here is how many references there are to authority. Yeah. How many references there are to the timing of things. He says immediate a lot. Okay. So immediately they did this, immediately they said this, immediately they saw, immediately he said, yeah. like there's this sense of quick pace. But I think also references to sight and hearing. Do you not have eyes to see or ears to hear? You don't see it yet. You don't yet understand. Like seeing and understanding are related. Hearing okay. and understanding are okay. related. And then there's this guy who he's multiple times he's healing blind people. He's casting out demons and it's immediate. And all of a sudden, this one one time, it's like, okay, he, he's healing, and it's like, wait a minute, it didn't immediately take? Well, oh, and, oh, a second time? Okay, finally, okay, maybe the he just didn't have a good contact or something with it. Yeah. But no, it's intentional that there's something about this progressive or gradual retaining of sight that occurs. And just to kind of foreshadow the next episode, we will see that clarity on the part of the disciples, specifically Peter, Peter, yeah, come to bear. Like he sees finally, finally, yeah, he sees. And so I think there's something to that too, where Mark's audience is going to go, oh, okay, it yeah. took a while, and multiple iterations of this authority and power demonstrated by Christ, and then he gets it, and then we see what happens once he gets it, yeah, 
and all of a sudden this thing keeps moving quick. It changes everything. It does. It does. That's cool. That's pretty cool. So I think one thing we got to wrestle with, you know, we we look at what it says, we we wrestle with what it means, and we locate that historically with the people present, the original audience of this gospel. And then the significance is always going to be how do we experience the meaning that's here. Yeah. And the meaning that's here is here's a guy who was blind and and saw and maybe didn't f- have full clarity of vision but eventually saw and that it wasn't a lack of power we don't know what it was a lack of but it was it wasn't Jesus it wasn't the reason yeah and we have disciples that have gathered and are still wrestling with understanding who he is clearly yeah and their faith ebbs and flows based on their ability to understand in the moment what yeah. they who he is so how do you, like what if you have a takeaway and you go okay as a dad as a husband as a pastor I can't encounter the word of God without being affected by it how does this affect you today Yeah yeah It's a good word um I you know one of the first things I want to do is put my myself in the the shoes of the guy that was healed um and how his probably mindset of what was happening changed. Mm. Um, I I wonder how he felt once he got, let's just say half vision. That's better than no vision. (laughs) We can stop right there. Like I'm satisfied with this or, you know, it, the text doesn't tell us, but it it does say that he looks intently after that second time. Yeah. And I'm thinking in that moment, like there's, there's gotta be a, uh, I can't believe this just happened. I, I, he touched me he spit on me and and now i can clearly see and so he, this is one of the things if we get to heaven and we get a chance to like hear the rest of these individuals stories yeah, yeah. You know, this guy and there's tons of people like this in the bible <laughs> like how did you live the rest of your life after that moment that's what i want to know like What's the rest of your story? We, we see what happens with Jesus and some of the disciples, but what about you? Like what about this guy, what happened there? And so there's that. Um, if, if he ever, this guy, if he ever heard the rest of Jesus and in the cross and the resurrection to think about where his faith should be because of what he's experienced, that's incredible. Right. Mm-hmm. And so then I go, well, I was never really blind and Jesus really made me see like that, but I do see how God has saved me from a lot of things from going up in a broken home and getting arrested myself a few times back in the day. Um, you know, like I I can see how God's pulled me out of those things. And so I want to look intently at him and his word and his calling on my life. Um, I want to finish out the rest of my story. Well, Hmm. You know, start connecting some of those dots. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good word. I think what I'm wrestling with is the the progressive component to it. That there are certainly days where my my vision of Jesus is more like, oh, look, I think I can see trees. They look like they're walking around. Okay. It's a little fuzzy. And it's not because I can't see him clearly. It's just that I don't look at him clearly. Yeah. And I think that 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 word intently, I think, is also telling that there's there's the Jesus has made himself known to me and he has made himself known clearly in the scriptures. So it's not that he hasn't made himself known, but that component of me looking intently at him and seeing him clearly, I think, is a good, a good challenge and insight from this text. Yeah, that the the way that he looked at at Jesus or whoever or whomever um, was described as intently. There's an adjective there placed, you know, on purpose. Yeah. And so, yeah, there are, I am tempted to not look as intently at the Lord and see him clearly some days. And yeah. I just, now I wrestle with, well, what is it that causes me to not look intently? And, yeah. and it's going to be things that, that maybe I'm convinced are more pleasurable. Yeah more fulfilling yeah uh m- maybe more rewarding 
may be things that I find to be more valuable, which I hesitate to say, but I mean, when we get down to the reality oh, for of it, sure. the day to day, man, our hearts are idol factories and we're constantly creating little things to worship that yeah. are not him. Yeah. And that's just an indicator of, man, this, this thing is, we are absolutely desperately broken in need of him all the time. And it doesn't matter if you've been walking with him for 40 years, the need is the same on day one and day What's 365 times 40? I should have picked a better number. <laughs> but thousands of days later, yeah, man. the need's the same because our hearts are broken. Yeah. And yes, we're, he is conforming us to the image of his son, but it's a, it's a slow process. Yeah. But one of the things I love in Mark is how real it is when it comes to the disciples realizing or learning something new about Jesus. And so even in this moment, they're learning something new. Um, I want to make sure that, that I don't assume at any point that I know who he is fully. Mm. Like there, he's, he's so big and so mighty that I can't become complacent in my thoughts of who he is. My heart needs to be open of the Lord may work in a new way in my life that he hasn't worked before. Yeah. The, the Lord may do something new in my life that I haven't seen him do. He may spit in somebody's. I mean, you know what I mean, though. Like, absolutely. That, yeah. For us to never feel like we've got them figured out, yeah, or we don't have more to see, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's t- that's such a good word. Yeah, because you know, I'm a kids pastor in Georgetown, Texas. I've done this for six ish years now. Here, yeah. I never thought I was going to be a kids pastor, right? But who's to say I'm going to be a kid's pastor for the next six years? Right. He knows that. Um, and I love what I do. And and so who who knows? He might move at some yeah, point. Yeah, he might do a different work. i got to be open for that. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. And his plan may be fully to keep me here, which I hope it is. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah, that's a good word. Well, thanks for coming and uh, taking and reading today, LJ. Oh, man. This is great. Hey, it was uh-huh. fun. If you're tuning in and anything that was sparked by our conversation here, if you want to weigh in on some of the things that we were wrestling with here, uh, please email me at takeandreadpodcast at gmail.com. I can get questions to LJ uh, if you have something for him. Uh, But I always love to get uh, emails and questions and comments. Also encourage you on if you're tuning in on YouTube or whatever um, means you're grabbing this podcast, leave a comment. Uh, a like, a share. It just helps people find us because yeah. I, my goal with this podcast is to get more and more people taking and reading the scriptures that I want to make much of him. Uh, I do not care to make much of myself. I do want to make much of him and people can meet him and learn of him through the word. And so more people yeah. reading the better. So, uh, go take and read. Thanks for tuning in. And LJ, thanks for being here, brother. Thanks for having me. All right. Blessings. Blessings.